Uh, hello. Wow. They told me when the music fades, I'm supposed to talk. So, uh, hi, I'm talking. Um, hello, I am Tony G, and, uh, and I wanted to talk to you about initial access. Um, I'm sure it's something that we all face, or many of us face in our uh, pen testing days. Um, but a little bit about me. So I'm ex-blue team, so I've kind of gone the other way. A lot, of, a lot of my colleagues are kind of going from red to blue, but I went the other way. Uh, via cybersecurity awareness training, which uh, I really thoroughly recommend anyone do. It's really worth it. Um, my passion at the moment is predominantly open source intelligence. Um, I've been doing the Trace Labs CTF, and, and I, I got massively distracted and forgot I needed to talk, so I nearly didn't turn up, so that would have been embarrassing. Um, but one of the things that I'm doing, and obviously the purpose of this talk, is really to talk about uh, my physical and remote social engineering and all of the other bits and pieces that we do kind of in the red team. Uh, I am also a pretty terrible purple teamer. Um, so yeah, we'll skip over that bit. But this talk is, as I said, all about initial access. And it's kind of all of the ways that I can kind of think of that attackers, or you, uh, can gain initial access into your environment or into your, your uh, adversary's environment. Um, and hopefully, some of these things you might be able to emulate yourself. So before I d get stuck in, though, it is very important, I guess, to kind of clarify what initial access is and what are the key elements that I'm going to talk about in, I guess, the MITRE attack chain. So I guess if you're not familiar with the term initial access, I mean, possibly at the wrong conference, but I don't know. Um, but if you're not familiar, it is essentially the, uh, the process that typically provides an attacker with the first foot in the door, if you like. Um, and you can see kind of this is the MITRE attack framework on the screen there, and it kind of sits between resource development and execution. Um, largely, everything in the red box we'll kind of talk about as part of this session. So I know, obviously, I said it's initial access, but there is a bit of execution, and obviously resource development and reconnaissance plays a really big part in your initial access as well. Um, but one, of course, one simple way of gaining access is through facilitated access. And I'm not talking about where you contact your client support and say, hey, run this phishing email for me. That, that's, that's, not a, that's an assisted foothold. That is not the same. And I'm not talking about someone literally opening the door for you to walk through to the office. What I'm talking about when I say facilitated access is I mean paying for access. So, of course, attackers are already paying for access into networks. So initial access brokers uh, sell access into your network or into the networks. They usually work as a bit like a middleman. So they, uh, they take credentials from one set of um, uh, criminals, and they sell them to another set of criminals. Um, and the access, I guess it usually kind of comes from, uh, from phishing or credential harvesting or even credential spraying, um, which we'll talk about those in a bit. I have to say, if I was going to be a criminal, I would probably say an initial access broker is probably the best job to be. Um, not that I want to do that, because like the risk is so minimal, right? Because you're buying credentials from someone else, and you're selling them to someone else. You never touch the criminal system, the victim systems. It's a genius idea. Anyway, um, so the image at the bottom there is, the, uh, is from uh, Ad Advent Intel. And uh, what was interesting, it kind of said that at the time, Citrix was the most in demand for uh, initial access brokers. But in reality, I think they'll take anything any kind of access into an environment. But you don't always have to pay for the access. The other option, of course, is to recruit people. And this is something that Lapsus did, uh, obviously now defunct. Uh, most of them are, are found guilty, certainly in the UK. And, and they were con directly advertising to, to employees and saying, hey, look, give us your credentials and we'll give you money. I've seen other people who do this, and in fact, I've seen ransomware um, gangs do this, and they say, look, we'll give you 50% of the ransom payment if you, give us the, if you give us credentials, which is nuts. I'm not sure I would take them up on it, because A, I don't think they would pay that 50%, and B, you're probably going to get caught straight away. It probably wouldn't be very sensible. 
Uh, but the other thing that we're seeing is, of course, North Korea and China are using LinkedIn quite aggressively to recruit people. Now, the MPSA, which is the new name for the CPNI, um, they've launched this Think Before You Link campaign. And the idea is they're highlighting that you know, attackers will reach out to you on LinkedIn. Typically, what they do is they give you uh, promises of you know, all expenses paid speaking gigs. So uh, sign me up. Uh, in anywhere you want, in any, any of the countries that they happen to operate in. The problem is, once you get to those countries, then there's quite a hard sell on you providing them access and, uh, yeah, a bit of a demand to do that. So maybe don't do that unless you are particularly desperate to uh, go to jail. Um, the other way, of course, is a supply chain attack. Uh, gaining access through that is, is extremely popular these days. Uh, and I think nowadays, I don't know if any of you are red teamers, if you are seeing now requests coming in to kind of simulate and emulate supply chain attacks, it's becoming extremely popular. Um, we, of course, all remember SolarWinds. Uh, the thing with SolarWinds is quite funny. Obviously, we remember the password, SolarWinds123. Um, we see this all of the time. How many companies have got this company name, one, two, three, or numbers? You just find that. And sometimes you can find it in OSINT. And so, you know, if you're using something like breach databases, you can quite often find supplier passwords in those breach databases that can give you an initial access into the environment. The other way, of course, is to compromise the external code base. Um, and now the thing with this is that code bases are obviously very, very heavily targeted for supply chain attacks. And often you'll find this, especially in your OSINT. Um, and so, you know, looking out for, for, for things that might be leaked is really, really valuable within those, those code bases. Now, I'm going to go kind of off on a little bit of a tangent because I want to talk about this. So this device, it's, this is an entirely true story, and this is very random, and you're, you, I don't really know why I've included it, but it's a lot of fun anyway. Um, so this device is the... Uh, pacemaker from a company called St. Jude Medical. And I'm missing an image there, bear with me a second. And there's a company called uh, MedSec. And what MedSec did is they found a vulnerability in this pacemaker. Now MedSec, are a, they were set up for one job, find a vulnerability in this product. They found this vulnerability and what they then did is rather than fixing the vulnerability or telling the company about the vulnerability. What they chose to do is they chose to sell it to a company called Muddy Waters Capital, who are a hedge fund. And you can see where they're going with this. And they built up a short position in the organization. And then MedSec, like the ethical organization they are, dropped that vulnerability like they were dropping the microphone. And that happened to their share price. And I, the reason I've included this is because, yes, it's not a technical initial access, but I've included it because it's interesting to show that supply chain attacks don't just involve access. It can also involve other stuff as well. Now, obviously, a really common way of gaining initial access is through uh, infrastructure-style attacks. And I want to start by talking about kind of some of the common defensive stacks that you, that you as attackers or... or or you as defenders will, will operate. And this is very much the full trust defensive stack. So you're going to have some kind of a VPN. You're going to have some kind of device with AP, AV. Um, I, I've chosen McAfee here. I think it's probably safe to say that's the traditional model. Uh, and you know, the device will, of course, have email available. Once you can get connected, you are essentially inside the internal network. It's largely very flat in most organizations. There'll be things like an Active Directory server. There'll be other desktops, laptops, that sort of stuff. You might find operational technology if you're uh, dealing with a particularly terrible company. And there'll be a plethora of other servers. But the other thing that's also really interesting is you'll often find internal access to their cloud environments. So you know, things like their Microsoft 365, you'll be able to access that without MFA, for example. So this is very much a traditional model. So how would we go about attacking that? Well, of course, ahead of any job, we need to perform some OSINT. And I think, for me, some of the key things we're going to need are 
you know, the SPF, DMARC, DKIM records. We're going to need to know what the mail security gateway looks like so we know what we're going to be up against. We're going to need te text records. And I cannot tell you, text records are so valuable because they just tell you who the suppliers are. And what's really interesting about text records, and if you're a defender and you're kind of thinking about your text records, more often than not, you put a text record in to verify your domain. It doesn't need to remain there. You can take it out. So you put it in for a short period of time, take it out, and then you're not giving away anything sensitive. Um, you might also find things like Microsoft 365 smart hosts. You might find whether they're using Teams or whether they got Slack, uh, you know, any of their VPNs or whether they got Citrix, that sort of stuff. The other things is, you know, thinking about what their staff access, because a lot of initial access will very much focus on targeting staff rather than targeting technology. Um, so having contact details is also really valuable. Typically, infrastructure attacks, though, will focus more heavily on accessing things like VPNs and, uh, and, and web applications. And I think web applications do still have a place. Of course, typically, it would love, lovely to get access through a VPN because you know you're going to be on the internal network. Um, but in reality, you might not find that. But applications do still have a value, uh, especially if you can get access to something like CMS, and you can install uh, your own, uh, own script and own technology in there, so that you can then gain uh, access onto that server and then move th internally. The downside is that the reality is you're probably going to be in a DMZ, which is going to make life a little bit more challenging. But there are lots and lots of things that you can do. So obviously, from web applications perspective, you've got command injection, remote code execution, SQL injection, and lots of other things that you can read there faster than I can say it to you. Um, you obviously have configurational weaknesses, and MFA is usually something that people forget to include. Um, information is often exposed, and that information can lead to other attacks. Um, the other day, I found something really simple. It was just the debug tag was enabled, but by that debug tag being enabled, I could then find out that it was running a really, really old version of the particular software, which had a code execution vulnerability. But without that debug tag being enabled, I wouldn't have found that uh, information. It would have been significantly harder. And then, of course, there's things like binary vulnerabilities, so you can identify software and you know, perhaps <coughs> download malware or whatever, do something to, to, the, uh, to, to the service itself. I think password attacks really work with infrastructure as well. <coughs> the only thing I would say is they're not always that as successful. Often you'll see in kind of like uh, in the news, you know, breach credentials give you access everywhere, but the reality is they don't actually. In a lot of cases, they're not that successful. Unless you've got databases which are very current, the reality is the majority of the passwords are going to be really old, and they're not going to be related to anything to do with what you're looking at. So you probably won't get in. Uh, if you are successful, your IP location is really, really important. Um, so using things like an anonymous VPN, uh, it, that's not going to work. Microsoft Identity Protection will block you straight away if you're using a, an anonymous VPN. Um, and your IP will need to be located near or in the country that you're, you're targeting. So, you know, there's a lot of challenges with it. Another way, of course, is you can issue a password reset. That's a pretty cool way of doing it. Um, the downside is you, you need to kind of break captures, which is a bit problematic. But of course, using advanced convivial neural networks, networks or CNNs, or uh, natural language processing, or NLPs, and of course, OCR, you can be a lot more successful and actually can break uh, captures. And we've, been, we've had some success in doing that in the past, which is pretty cool. Um, but just generally exploiting those perimeter devices is probably the best solution. And things like local file inclusions are really valuable, I think, uh, especially if you're looking at a, a VPN where you can perhaps get credentials just by those uh, local file inclusions or, or memory read vulnerabilities. And that will allow you to then be able to just log in through that VPN. Um, there's a really good talk at DEF CON about SSL VPNs. Worthwhile having a read of, uh, a watch of that, I would say. What I would say, if you are a defender, you really need to be patching your VPNs. Uh, like your VPN, you've got hours, possibly days at most, before exploitation of any serious remote code execution vulnerabilities. Um, 
That's assuming it's not already a zero day, which uh, it's quite possible it will be. So that's kind of like the traditional stack. But nowadays, of course, we're coming up much more against uh, a more zero trust style stack. And this is the traditional Microsoft zero trust stack. Um, so obviously, we'll have MFA in there. Often, we'll have SSO um, and loads and loads of cloud infrastructure. Uh, and fundamentally, access will be through MFA. Uh, and that will be secured either on the device, uh, sorry, on the device, it will be an Intune secured device, so there'll be lots and lots of configuration there as well. Um, and things like Defender, Microsoft Defender for Enterprise, will be installed in most cases on that uh, managed device as well. Clients will have email though, so that is something. But to kind of, once you get past all of that though, it's pretty decent. You know, you've got pretty much the whole of Azure, so it's, it's worthwhile doing it. Um, in a Mac environment, which uh, I'll be honest, uh, I rarely come up against. Most of our colleagues rarely come up against a pure Mac environment. But typically in their zero trust environment, you'll have obviously devices with, with mail. There'll be some kind of random AV on there. It might be more advanced than McAfee. Um, they'll obviously be MFA, but typically they'll be doing that through a third party solution, something like Okta. Maybe with Okta Verify that you can see in the middle there, which does passwordless authentication and SSO, which is pretty cool. But fundamentally, that will direct you to some kind of SaaS application portal. Um, uh, and obviously, there'll also be some kind of third party SIM in there. Whereas in, in the case of Microsoft, you're going to have Sentinel in the middle looking after everything you do. In reality, though, as I'm sure you all know, if you're red teamers, you are going to come across a mixture of all of this. There will be a very much complex environments with a bit of cloud and a bit of legacy, and there'll be a bit of uh, uh, zero trust and a bit of full trust all in the mix. Which means, in reality, that phishing is fundamentally the only way to get in when you get a zero trust environment. So typical defensive stacks you find when you're phishing, especially Microsoft environments. Um, most organizations are really quite mature in this space now, especially if you're using Microsoft 365. So your SPF, your DKIM, your DMARC, all of that's going to be in place. There'll be verification against all of that. You'll have URL rewriting using safe links within Microsoft. Um, you'll have uh, URL inspection as well. And even in some cases, URL detonation. So that wonderful payload you got at the end of your link you run that, and then, of course, they detect it, which is tedious. Um, there'll be safe attachments as well, so you can't just fire in an attachment and hope you're going to get luck. Um, when it comes to the browser, the mark of the web will be the worst thing that you come up against. It's so annoying. Um, and then, of course, the, the, there'll be web proxies and web categorization uh, and all of that stuff that's going to make your life significantly harder. And then, of course, you then look at the endpoint itself, and that's where EDR comes in and app blocker and everything else. So it's quite complex these days to exploit mails, uh, exploit end endpoints through email. So realistically, this OSINT is so valuable when it comes to mail. So text records, look for those suppliers. Uh, I'd kind of recommend using that XFISH test, know before. That's the, the header for know before. Um, so if you send an email in with that and they've got no before, it might just bypass filtering. Worthwhile doing that. Um, it's, quite, it's quite exciting when you do that. and You realize that you've defeated their security awareness training by doing security awareness training, which is quite funny. Um, look on things like job sites for technology. That's always really useful, because then you can identify the technology that works. Obviously, things like LinkedIn will also tell you the technology that individuals might be using. Fundamentally, though, your links need to come from trusted domains. Um, you can't just stand up a server and fire in a link and expect someone's going to click on it and it's going to work. It's got to come from somewhere trusted. So something like GitHub, for example, is quite useful. Um, I also like to use Azure Edge. I prefer Azure Edge over CloudFront, so using some of those C CDNs from those providers. What I like about Azure Edge over CloudFront is that it's a Microsoft solution. Uh, people are used to seeing it in Microsoft environments. And you have a lot of customization. So one of the things that you can't do um, is, of course, buy a domain M1 Microsoft, right? You can't do that. 
But you can buy Microsoft.AzureEdge.net. I mean, technically, you can't buy Microsoft because they've, they've blocked that. But you can buy something like Microsoft OneDrive.AzureEdge.net, and it just works. It's so ridiculous. Um, so yeah, you can properly typo squat on those domains, which is quite amusing. Um, you absolutely have to have custom payloads, and we will talk about that in a little bit, because realistic, realistically, your attachments are probably not going to work. Um, but let's, let's see. So basic phishing like this, it's probably dead. Uh, you know, I think corporate controls are pretty good. End user awareness is improving. So if we look at um, the Verizon data breach report, uh, I follow that every year. And the last three years, the uh, breaches as a result of, of human interaction has fallen from 85% to 82% to 75% now. Yes, it's still really high, but we are improving things. That's good. But phishing does still work, of course, because otherwise we wouldn't be in a job. Um, but I think it's much harder now. Uh, and you have to do a lot more to get a lot more success. So use things like spam testers. They really work. Review the headers. If you can get a chance and you can get a copy of the email back from the client, do that and change your, your email based on the response that their servers have got. It's a little bit like cheating, but I think you can probably, you know, you can probably work it out. You, can, you could probably say that you were able to simulate that by, I don't know, perhaps sending an email about where do I send my CV to in, in, in a recruitment way or whatever. Um, do check your link, your, your link you're sending to see what domain categorization it's got. Because if your domain has got a categorization of malware, <laughs> you're not going to get very far with it. If your domain's got no categorization, like an unknown categorization, you might struggle. Organizations are getting better. Years ago, when, when I first started in cybersecurity, um, you know, we had to allow the unknown categorization because the company we were using just hadn't categorized domains. So like, websites just stopped working. They're much better now. So you need to have a domain with reputation that's got categorize, categorization. The techniques I find that work really well is, uh, is spoofing still does work. And I tend to find it works better spoofing suppliers than spoofing the company domain. Because more often than not, they've got, um, they've got protection in place that will, will detect when a spoofing email is coming in. But they won't have it for their suppliers. So, for example, you could spoof one of their major suppliers who maybe that supplier doesn't have a, a very good SPF record or they've got, their, they've got poor DMARC configuration. So you could easily spoof that domain. I found the other day, I, I sent in an email and the company had a really, really good SPF record configured. And I was spoofed it and I thought, well, give it a go, see if it lands. And it actually landed in the inbox and I was like, how did that work? That's magic. Basically, what they'd done is they'd put the email address of this sender on an allow list because it kept getting blocked when their supplier sent email in. So it meant that I could, I could spoof the real sender and just landed it in the mailbox. It was perfect. It worked really well. It's really effective. Um, I find that using third-party services like Outlook.com or AWS Mail works quite well. Interestingly, with AWS Mail, you can actually often spoof the domain name of the company as a subdomain on AWS Mail, and their spoofing protection will not check that. It will check the domain, but not the subdomain. So for example, you could have client name.awsmail.com, and it actually works. It gets through their protection, which is quite cool. Uh, the other thing is, of course, you can use Microsoft Smart Hosts. Um, if you know about those, you know how effective they are. Um, I might not be able to talk in detail on that, but, but largely you can send raw SMTP messages through the smart hosts and spoof internal staff, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is kind of how it works. So the, these, are, these are them, but I'm not going to tell you exactly how it works, but, but largely this is how it works. They have um, a smart host set up. Every Microsoft 365 client's got smart host set up, and unless they've configured it correctly, you can send email. And the reason for these existing, and you can do this anonymously, I should say. The reason for these existing is because if you've got a multifunction printer or something like that, 
it often doesn't have the capability to support user authentication. Certainly doesn't have the capability to support MFA. So you can set up the capability for it to just send a message straight in. Now, what Microsoft recommends that you do is you use IP restrictions, you use connector rules, and you use transport rules um, so that only messages coming from this particular IP address can use their smart host. No one does that, apart from people who've already been fished by this attack technique because people forget about it. So they might have spent hundreds of thousands on their Minecast solution over here, and you just bypass it by directly sending it to Microsoft 365 using a spoofing capability. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty scary, pretty nuts, and it does work quite well, um, which is quite funny. Um, <clears throat> the other option is NTLM theft. Uh, so outbound SMB connections, um, you can embed those within the email itself. So stick something like a one-by-one one image um, with a, a file link, link to it to, a, um, to an SMB server. And as long as they've got port 445 enabled outbound, you will get a net NTLM hash, which can be cracked offline, which is quite cool. Um, and it does work actually surprisingly effective. And the reason it works is because most organizations have implemented split tunneling on their VPNs, and of course people work from home now, um, and so whilst they've got this fantastic email security and fantastic network security in the office, as soon as they go to home, all of that's gone. The split tunnel means it goes directly out to the internet, it doesn't go via the VPN. So, um, so yeah, it does actually work really well. Um, so it's worthwhile having a look at that. Um, I would say though, you know, if they've got good password policies, those off, that offline cracking is probably going to be a little, little bit less successful. Um, and the big problem with this attack is, of course, MFA. We are back to the problem with MFA. MFA is actually really good. It's annoying. It does the job. It works really, really well. Um, so what options have we got to bypass MFA? Um, what's going on my slides? I'll probably catch up in a second. There we go. Um, so we've got essentially five options. We can fish them and ask them for the credentials, the, the token. We can smish them and ask them. That works really well. I've done that quite a few times. Just send them a message saying, hey, it's Dave from IT. And, uh, and you know, we're investigating some problems with your account. We need a token from you. If you've got an iPhone and your victim has an iPhone, iMessage is really useful because what you can see is you can see when they've read the message. So the minute they read it, you hit send that message on the SMS and you know that it arrives at the same time as they're reading that message and they are more likely to respond to it. And it does work really well. But the other option is, of course, you can phone them up. That works really well. But those three rely on you convincing an end user to do something, whereas session token capture that relies on you beating the organization to prevent that session token from being abused. Um, often, well, I so say rarely, you're going to find an MFA bypass. Um, more often than not, that's as a result of configurational error. So the reality is the top four are the options that we've got. So session tokens are so valuable because, of course, if we can get the session token, all of that stuff before MFA is irrelevant because we can then bypass all of that and get straight into the Microsoft 365 environment, and then, of course, onto the Azure uh, further environment. Now, you will find that things like SIM uh, will pick up on this, you know, because you'll often have, depending on where your IP address is, you might have this impossible travel kind of concept. So if you're carrying out this activity against an organization in America, and you're using an IP address in the UK, that's stupid, firstly, but secondly, you know, Sentinel's going to detect that. It's an impossible login. Um, however, people do routinely log in on two different devices, like a mobile phone, for example, and a desktop computer. And their mobile phone might be connected to uh, a wireless network or a, 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 you know, a 3G or 4G network rather than wireless. And as a result, <coughs> you know, that's, it's acceptable that it's a different IP address, but make sure it's close by. Um, when it comes to Mac, same sort of situation. Get yourself a Nocta token users using the same technique, but you're in reality going to gain access only to the SaaS apps. One thing I would say, actually, with session tokens for, um, for a Windows environment or for a Microsoft 365 environment, 
What's really interesting is that Microsoft Defender for Cloud URLs is really effective. And, and it actually works. And it's so frustrating when you come up against it. Because you then can't find the URL for things like Outlook. It just doesn't work. Um, often you'll find misconfigurations. I found this a little while ago um, on an assessment. They'd followed Microsoft's instructions for setting up conditional access policies. Uh, and one of the settings is when you add a machine to the Microsoft 365 environment, you're required to, uh, to turn off MFA on that machine if you're using conditional access policies. But what happened is this organization hadn't realized that you also needed to, on that conditional access policy to apply that correctly. So the machine, to add a machine to their environment, I didn't need MFA. I just added, it to, added my own machine to the environment with username and password, and it just let me log straight in and gave me all of the Microsoft Defender for Cloud, and it worked perfectly fine. So look out for that. And it literally was a result of Microsoft instructions saying, you should turn this off if you've got conditional access policy. What they didn't say is you should also turn it on over here. So worthwhile looking at that. So how do you go about grabbing them? Well, of course, you know, our friend Evil Jinx uh, or Evil Engine X, depending on how you want to say it, um, works really, really well. Uh, and once you've got those session tokens, you can use that for further, in, further evaluation throughout the environment. VPNs often use a session token from Microsoft 365. So you, know, you get yourself your 365 authentication, and then you can get yourself into the VPN. Um, you can also, if you can't do that, use it for internal phishing. Send emails from your, uh, from your victim to other victims with attachments that are malicious. And you never know, you might get lucky. It's come from a trusted source. So it might get successfully delivered. Um, you can use links, uh, upload files to OneDrive, uh, and send a link. It's likely to be trusted. The Azure CLI is incredibly useful, and often not locked down. Not as well, should we say. So for example, many organizations will lock down something like portal.azure.com, uh, because they don't want their staff access in the portal for one bizarre reason. They might not lock down those same controls in the Azure CLI. So you can then use that to start to interact with the environment. You can also use tools like Road Tools and uh, Azure uh, AAD internals. Really, really useful tools. Um, even if you haven't got credentials, AAD internals is exceptionally useful. Um, and you can use that to perhaps gain access to non-MFA protected services or even in certain cases, get tokens forged, session tokens forged, so you can essentially log in as anybody. It's a quite unique attack, but it's very, very cool when it works. But there are, of course, other social engineering attacks we can do, which we haven't necessarily thought of, because it's not all about attacking infrastructure. We've got mobile phones, and if we look at a defensive stack of a mobile phone, um, well, it's just the person in the middle, um, which is not ideal. Uh, which is quite convenient for us, though, um, but not ideal for, for defenders. Um, so smishing does still work. Uh, less so, actually, I've noticed recently. Um, people are becoming a lot more wise to it, so your lure very much needs to be decent. Your links need to be decent. Um, typo squat domains, I think, work quite well here. Um, and if you combine that with an Evil Engine X or even Jinx instance, um, uh, and the right pretext, it can be extremely effective. Um, I often find using pretext out of hours, talking about perhaps a security incident works well, because you know they're going to tap that link on their mobile phone rather than on their computer or anything. Also, QR codes work quite well, because of course QR codes work on a phone, uh, so you can use those in, in place of a link. So send the QR code instead of, um, instead of a link, and then they will uh, activate that link and it doesn't display in, on the screen, um, which is really useful. On a mobile phone, no browser exploits are certainly a thing. You might get lucky, but the reality is, let's be honest, if you've got a zero-click remote code execution vulnerability with escalation on a mobile phone, are you going to use that on a red team? No. You're going to sell it to Zerodium for at least a million dollars, aren't you? Um, because that's far more valuable to you. Uh, so unless you are a nation state, you're unlikely to find this is going to come against you. Um, because why would you? Why would you unless it's a really, really valuable red or purple team uh, or particularly something that you want to burn? There is not much value in it, in my opinion. 
Another option you can use is Teams. So phishing with Teams is actually pretty fun um, because up until recently, this is, uh, the default was anyone with a Teams instance can message anybody else with a Teams instance. In fact, anyone with an Outlook.com email address could message anybody with a Teams instance, unless the organization have locked it down. By default, now it's locked down, but most organizations who've already made that move won't, won't have even thought of this as an attack technique. And the really cool thing is that you bypass all of their controls because it goes directly to staff in Teams. Now, what happens now is you get this external banner war warning. That came in this year. Last year, it didn't have this. This was exceptionally effective last year because it would just have the tiny little external warning you could just about see on the left of the screen there. Everything else was perfectly normal. So you could typo squat on a user's name, typo squat on a domain, uh, set up a fake Microsoft 365 account uh, with that typo squat domain, and it was extremely effective. Um, Using, but now they've got more warnings, so you have to get creative. So I use things like external at the end of the person's name, uh, or I use a, a company name. So in this case, I, I spoofed a, a user and pretended they were from Deloitte um, because that was the organization's external auditor. And then when it popped up with the external at the end of it, that kind of made sense. And the end user, the victim, said, yeah, all right, I'm, I'm on board with that. Um, the other cool thing is you get presence indicators. So presence indicators can be extremely valuable for you if you then want to tie this in with something like uh, a phishing attack or if you want to know that they're at, the, at their desk before you send that phishing attack or that smishing attack. So really, really useful to use presence indicators. Um, links work quite well. However, you can't really send, you can't send attachments. But what you can do is you can send links that are hosted on OneDrive. And they work quite well. And I'll talk about that in just a second, because I've got a, a slide that talks about how we can send links via OneDrive. Um, the other option <laughs> sounds totally ridiculous. <laughs> Genuinely, we've done this. Um, it does actually work. It's sending a letter. Send a postal fish. Um, I think we ended up calling it pishing, which um, sounds a bit like Scottish for getting drunk. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so you send, if you send it with a link or, or even a QR code, people trust letters. It's like, it's okay, it's a letter, it's come from the postman. The downside is you do have to kind of wait for the postman to deliver it, so it takes a little while. It's not as dynamic, put it that way, as sending a phishing email. Um, deep fakes work quite well as well, so you can use a deep fake. Uh, a client of ours actually had a real deep fake uh, target one of their staff in finance. And, um, and what happened is it was a senior member of staff, and essentially that was deep faked. And they contacted someone in finance, got a push payment uh, sent through, and they totally believed they were speaking to the CEO. It, it actually did work. It's really, really interesting. Because staff are not expecting that sort of stuff. Um, there is, of course, our friends, ChatGPT or, or large language uh, models, and they are making, and AI in general is making social engineering attacks, especially on the phone, so much easier. Um, we actually did this for real. Uh, so. People might recognize my boss up there, Ken Monroe. Um, Ken, uh, we decided to spoof him, so we use caller ID spoofing, um, just using VoIP um, uh, and a specific SIP trunk. Uh, and then we used machine learn voice replication to replicate his own voice and then rung him up. And it got a bit confusing for him um, as he thought he was going mad talking to himself, which is quite funny. Uh, but to be honest, it's, it's fair, fair games with him, I'd say. Um, yeah, fun times. Physical attacks are also another really useful attack. Um, things like this, of course, everyone forgets physical attacks when it comes to initial access. Um, barriers like this look scary, but you can just walk past that one. Um, if it's proper turnstiles, uh, this is one of my colleagues, um, and this is actually on a client site, which is why it's all blurred. And he's just carrying out a, um, uh, a long man attack, so he's going to use his bag to block the barriers. Um, I do this time and time again. It's so easy to get through those barriers. Um, no one notices them. Let me just pause that, because it's incredibly noisy. Um, no one notices you follow behind them. And even when they do notice, they don't care. I've been through barriers where the barriers flash bright red and the alarm's gone off and no one cares. <laughs> Carry on walking in. 
Um, so definitely, on a red team, it is worthwhile including physical as an attack technique. Um, it is usually quite trivial to break in. Uh, sometimes it's extremely easy to break in, um, <laughs> which is quite amusing. But what you can do once you do break in is you can then install yourself a network implant. And once you install those network implants, then you can have a nice hacker-friendly platform on their network without any kind of challenges. Now, yes, you might have network access control, but no, that does not cause many problems for most people. Um, or alternatively, just walk into the data center, because more often than not, that's not very so good. This, this one here is actually from a real site, and, um, and this, it was the most ridiculous social engineering job I ever had. Because I got there really early in the morning thinking, right, I'm going to try and get in nice and early, gain access to this environment. And I got there, and I'm like, the lights are not on. And how am I going to get in? I can't follow anyone in if there's no one in there. Anyway, I waited for about an hour, and nothing happened. No one came in, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. So I ended up going and speaking to the security guard and saying, hey, look, I'm an employee from this company, and uh, I need to gain access to, to the office, but my, my card, my phone doesn't really work. They, they use phone-based access. My phone doesn't work. Anyway, after lots of conversations, he gave me his ID badge, so I just walked in. I found myself in an empty office. That was CTF. It was insane. It was so much fun. I broke into everything. And this, this room, breaking into here, I used a dinner knife. It had one of those maglots. I used a dinner knife to push it open enough so that I could give it a really big, big jam and, yeah, popped open the, the door and, you know, game over at that point. It was quite amusing. Um, Combination of attacks, of course, is so valuable as well. So, you know, we can combine lots of different things. So I've sort of mentioned a few of them already, but... Using a fake instance of Teams, we can announce a physical visitor. So we can say, hey, look, you know, we've got a, 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 it's, you know, it's Dave from Deloitte. We've got one of our guys arriving. Um, you know, can you, if you can find out who the receptionist, can you get him set up with a pass? And that already sets that pretext in motion. Um, teams messaging messages work really well as well to set up another call. Um, you could even use it perhaps if you wanted to set up a vishing call. So you can actually phone using those Teams instances. Um, and you can see a ton of others uh, on the screen there. So just think about how you can combine those different attacks for more effective uh, compromise. Now, I talked a little bit about payloads and how we can kind of use those, but let's dig into that area. Um, now, OneDrive is so useful. So, of course, you can host your files on OneDrive. Um, interestingly, commercial OneDrive, so Microsoft 365 OneDrive, is really annoying because you can't force the application to download it. So if you've got something like an Office document, and if you are still using macros, which uh, you might not be, most people aren't, but if you are, um, it's annoying when it opens up in uh, Word on the web. <clears throat> what you want it to do is you want it to download to their client so you get execution on the client. You can't really do that now. You used to be able to do it just by putting download equals one at the end of the URL and it would just work. Um, so you can't do that. But you can use Outlook.com's OneDrive. It looks very similar. It will load exactly the same in Teams or wherever you're sending it. Uh, and if you, put, if you need to go into, um, I think you need to find the embed code for it and then change embed to download, and it will just download the file for you. So much better. Um, however, Mark of the Web will come back to bite you. Um, so think about maybe packing files, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Like, in fact, literally in a second. So lots and lots of common file types that you can use for execution. My favorites, personally, I really still like HTML smuggling. Um, I know it's a bit old hat now, um, but I do still quite like it because it you can have so much more flexibility with, with it. I like, personally, what I like to do is I like to have an HTML smuggled file landing on, so they click a link and go to the file rather than sending it as an attachment. Um, but, you know, ISO images work really, really well still. Uh, OneNote, which is uh, Quackbot's uh, uh, file of choice, um, or when it used to be, uh, they're now defunct. And, uh, you know, OneNote attachments work quite well, um, or even having those served by something else that downloads them, that's quite useful. Uh, on a Mac, you're going to want things like uh, um, installer packages, um, because they're going to give you the most flexibility. But, you know, interestingly, on Macs, VBA macros still work quite well, because 
there's so much limited control on a Mac from uh, Active Directory. Yes, there is a bit more with Intune. Um, <clears throat> and so controlling that Office application is often something they don't think about. They think much more about the Windows environment. So you might get lucky and find that macros are not disabled uh, and there's not as much control on the Mac. So some other thoughts kind of in, in Windows. Uh, I think Word, Excel, executables, pretty well detected now. Um, smart screen will likely kill you straight away. Um, mark of the web is bypassable, so do that. Um, zip files work quite well for doing that. Uh, ISO image files, as I've already mentioned, they're really useful. And, and OneNote, uh, that's really useful. And then you can get that through an HDA executing living off the land binaries. They qu work quite well. Um, as I mentioned, macros don't work very much well now, especially on Word and Excel. However, you can use macros in other Office documents. And this comes back to your pretext and how you make that document. So you can stick it in a PowerPoint and have a macro-enabled PowerPoint. And if you use the Office Ribbon X editor, you can actually have it sort of emulate the open exec command so that it will pop up with that warning that they need to execute macros. There are other, one, other files, of course, that support macros as well that you could use, but, um, or support auto-exec that you could use, but um, I quite like PowerPoint because no one expects it, and certainly no one's locked it down. Um, you can also consider making your own OAuth applications, so that will give you more of an initial foothold, which you could then potentially use on internal phishing attacks. So. We need to fix this, though. So how do we go about fixing all of this stuff? Um, well, we're kind of well on the way, actually, already. Social engineering attacks are harder. Social staff uh, training is getting better. Awareness, I think, for, for me, is really key, but not just awareness. It's cultural changes in our understanding of what good cybersecurity looks like. Um, and I think this is especially important when we're dealing with smishing and vishing and those in-person attacks. Um, but there are, of course, some technical things you can do. So carrying out things like attack surface assessments or attack surface management exercises. The thing I would say, though, I, my attack surface session assessments are what I love the most at PTP. It plays very much into my uh, OSINT mindset. Um, but the thing is, the majority of attack surface management tools predominantly look at the technology that you're publishing, because that's what an attack surface assessment is, right? That's what you should be doing. But I think you need to look beyond that. You need to look at things like, what are your staff publishing to GitHub? What are your staff publishing to LinkedIn? You know, all of these other places you're publishing information, what are they doing? What are your social media firms themselves leaking? I get into most of the places I get in because the company themselves have published an ID badge, which I can then replicate and then use to gain access. So understand also, separately to that, understanding who your threat actors are by doing threat modeling. And there's a really, really cool tool, this, this tool, um, which you can see the link on there, Categorized Adversary TTPs. It's so useful. It kind of brings together ETDA and MITRE and puts them all together and then you can say, look, I want to find out, you know, my, my organization is based in the UK and they're in this category. I want to find out who all of the threat actors are, not just the ones that MITRE have got because they don't have very many and also want to find out who, um, who EDTA have got, which have got a lot, but they're, they're not aligned to MITRE so they don't have all of the TTPs. This brings it all together. Really, really cool. Um, do your own OSINT as well. So I've written a load of blogs, and that, that's kind of a short link to a search on our, our site for OSINT if you're scared about clicking links. Um, but yeah, that's really, really good. And I've written loads of blogs on how you can actually do your own corporate-style OSINT to understand what your organization itself is leaking. Um, because I think <clears throat> understanding what you kind of leak is understands what your attackers are going to find, and it will allow you to remediate those issues that actually matter, not TLS, um, fixing your whatever TLS issues you've got. You can clearly I don't do web testing because I'm not a nut nutter. Um, <clears throat> fixing your SPF, your DMARC, and your DKIM are probably one of the easiest and most effective things that you can do. Your DNS is what you control. It's like publishing your own rubbish to social media. It's that terrible when you get it wrong. But fixing your SPF stops so many attacks. 
It really does, as does DMARC and DKIM. Put your DMARC in reject mode. So many people I find have got DMARC in none. Well, that's really flipping helpful, isn't it? What's the point of that? Put it in reject mode. Be confident. You trust your email. Um, the other thing you can do, monitoring for brand name infringements, is so valuable. That'll help you spot those typo squat domains. Um, I've come up against this a lot. There's a lot of cheaper products you can get. Um, uh, there's also a lot of expensive products you can get from some of those threat intelligence providers. Um, or you can just do it manually with yourself with URL crazy, but they'll take a little while. Um, but you know, there's a lot of tools you can use to do that, and I recommend doing that. Um, setting up your transport rules, uh, or I've made a wonderful typo there, or connector rules um, uh, on 365 will help spot that, uh, stop that internal relay abuse. Um, and the Teams allow list is one configuration, literally one setting. I don't want anybody to allow me unless they're on this allow list. And that's it. And then you stop Teams from being accessible externally. It's ridiculous. Um, and then there's so many other little things to do, which I think I've got a few minutes, so we'll run through those. Um, so using, of course, Defender for Enterprise, uh, it's very effective if you've got a Microsoft environment, which obviously we're talking about here. Um, identity protection, password protection, so valuable. Um, obviously, MFA, uh, not push notifications, conditional access policy. You, know, can you, you can read on the screen there. But um, uh, I think building yourself some kind of strong security and monitoring every stage in every department and implementing those appropriate capabilities with a SOC is so valuable. And I think that's where many organizations fall down, especially the ones that we carry out purple teaming attacks with. You know, we're starting to work, we work with them and we talk to their SOC and, and the reality is their SOC is not really that mature. They don't really know what's going on. But I guess that's kind of why you do a purple team. But you know, having a really good mature SOC will really help defend against many of these attacks. Um, as is establishing a DevSecOps function, um, super valuable, I would suggest, to help continually evaluate and remediate your configuration so that you know you're implementing those new controls and new, new uh, uh, fixes as quickly as you can. <coughs> um, finally, purple teaming. I think there's so much value in doing some purple teaming um, because I really think that helps train your SOC in how to detect some of these malicious attacks. Uh, and that, hopefully, should help you build, this is a terrible pun, I'm so sorry, uh, a, a culture of cybersecurity to, uh, to evaluate your technical controls and fundamentally to make the bad guys cry, um, which, um, but yeah, I'm sorry, it's a terrible pun. But anyway, I think I've got two minutes before the next speaker for some questions. So any questions? <laughs>